Today I'd like to look at a nice correspondence between trigonometric functions, more specifically sine and cosine, and a really famous pair of sequences of numbers, the Fibonacci numbers and the Luca numbers. And well, let's jump right into it. So we'll start with a version of Euler's formula for the Fibonacci and Luca numbers, and this starts to tie these two, you know, pairs of objects that don't really seem similar together. So let's recall that Euler's formula says that cosine theta plus i sine theta is equal to e to the i theta. It really tells us how to deal with complex exponentials. There are several proofs of this formula. I've done a couple on the channel. I'll let you guys look for those if you want that. Well, a version of Binet's formula for Fibonacci and Luca numbers will say that the nth Luca number over 2 plus the square root of 5 times the nth Fibonacci number over 2 is equal to the golden ratio to the nth power. So let's sketch how this goes. So we won't go all the way from the ground, but we'll go from a starting point which I think is familiar. But maybe before we do that, let's recall how these numbers are defined. So the Fibonacci numbers are defined by f sub 0 equals 0, f sub 1 equals 1, and then fn plus 2 is equal to fn plus fn plus 1. So one term is equal to the sum of the previous two terms. So those are Fibonacci numbers. And then Luca numbers are defined, well, almost the same, except the seeds are different. So we'll take L sub 0 to be equal to 2, we'll take L1 to be equal to 1, and then again the recursion is the same. So Ln plus 2 is equal to Ln plus Ln plus 1. And then, you know, if we wanted to do this, and maybe this is a good thing to do to get a feel for how these things grow, we could make like a chart, if you will. So let's put Fibonacci numbers on the top and Luca numbers on the bottom, and we'll just go maybe the 0th, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, maybe as much room as we have. So here we'll have 0, 1, 1, and then 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. Then we'll have 8, and then we'll have 13. So those are the first several Fibonacci numbers. And then for the Luca numbers, we'll have 2, 1, 3. So the next one will be 3 plus 1 is 4. The next one will be 7. The next one will be 11. And then 18. And then let's see, 29. So the Luca numbers are going to clearly get bigger faster because the seeds are larger. But generally, the growth rate is the same. OK. Well, now that we have this, there's also maybe a well-known closed formula for each of these. And I'm not going to derive this. I think I've done this for Fibonacci numbers on the channel, you know, a few times. You can do it with matrices or there are a couple of other methods to do this. But what you'll land at is the following expression. So the nth Fibonacci number is equal to C to the n and then minus minus 1 to the n times to the minus n all over the square root of 5, where phi is the golden ratio. That is, phi is equal to 1 half times 1 plus the square root of 5. So in other words, phi satisfies the equation phi squared equals phi plus 1. And it's the positive root to that equation. And then Luca numbers have a similar closed formula that looks like this. So we have the nth Luca number is phi to the n plus minus 1 to the n times phi to the minus n. So something like that. Okay, great. So now let's observe that if we add the Fibonacci and Luca number, well, nothing nice happens. But if we clear the denominator on the Fibonacci number and we add it to the Luca number, observe that this minus 1 to the n times phi to the minus n and this minus 1 to the n times phi to the minus n will cancel because they're attached to two opposite signs. And you'll end up with twice phi to the n. 
But if you divide both sides by two, you get this Binet formula right here, or this version of the Binet formula right here, which is like maybe our Euler's formula for Luca and Fibonacci numbers. In other words, it's like our first tie together of these two ideas. So maybe before we move on to the next little bit that'll tie the, these sequences of numbers together with the trig functions, let's maybe talk about who's playing what role here. So observe that Luca numbers over two are playing the role of cosine, and then Fibonacci numbers over two are playing the role of sine. And then let's see, the square root of five is playing the role of i, because notice here we have an i, here we have a square root of five. And then maybe lastly, e to the i is playing the role of phi. So that's like our translation from this one world to the other world. Okay, so next up, let's see if we can get something similar to the Pythagorean trig identity for these Fibonacci and Luca numbers. And in that, it's actually not so hard. So let's observe if we take ln over two and we square it, and then we subtract five times fn over two squared, we get quite a bit of simplification. So let's see what we get. So we're gonna have a quarter, and then we've got, let's see, this ln squared, but what's that gonna be? So that's gonna be phi to the two n, and then it'll be plus two times minus one to the n, and then phi n times phi minus n, but those are gonna cancel. And then let's see, finally we'll have plus phi to the minus two n. So that's what we get from squaring this Luca number. And then we've got this one over four from the squaring the two in the denominator. And then let's see for this Fibonacci number. Observe that this five will cancel the square root of five squared. And then we'll also get a quarter out front just like we did before. So this is gonna be minus a quarter. And then let's see what we get if we square this. So we'll have phi to the two n and then minus two times minus one to the n. That's from the product of these two, maybe the cross terms, if you will. And then plus phi to the minus two n. Okay, good. But notice that we get some cancellation. So here we have a phi to the two n, and then here we have a, another phi to the two n, but they're attached to opposite signs, so they'll cancel. And then likewise, here we have a phi to the minus 2n and a phi to the minus 2n. They're attached from opposite signs because of that minus sign between, so they will cancel. And then, well, observe that we've got a 2, a quarter, a 2, a quarter. These two minus signs cancel. So this all turns out to be minus 1 to the n. Okay, well, that's not quite like the Pythagorean trig identity, but it's pretty close. So let's get that formula on the board as well, and then we'll move on to maybe, and then we'll move on to something else. So we've already forged two bridges between these two kind of disparate seeming objects or pairs of objects, and now we're going to do one more. And it's going to start, well, on the trig side with Euler's formula. Okay, so let's look at maybe cosine of m times theta plus i times sine of m times theta. Okay, so maybe using Euler's formula, that's gonna be the same thing as e to the i m theta, where we simply replace theta with m times theta. But now using exponent rules, that's gonna be e to the i theta raised to the m power. But now that's gonna be equal to cos theta plus i sine theta all raised to the m power. And that's maybe using Euler's formula on the inside. But now that's a binomial that is raised to the mth power. And we've got a binomial theorem that tells us how to expand this. So this will be the sum as k goes from zero up to m of m choose k. And then let's see, we'll have i to the uh, k 
and then cosine to the m minus k theta and then sine to the k theta. Okay, but observe that even powers of i will be plus minus one. In other words, the, they will be pure real numbers, whereas odd powers of i will be plus minus i. They'll be pure imaginary numbers. So that motivates us to split this up into two sums, the even part and the odd part. So let's do that. So splitting it up into the even part, we have the sum as k goes from zero to the floor of m over two. So I'm doing this and then simultaneously re-indexing k to two times k. We'll have minus one to the k. That comes from the fact that we had i to the two k, but obviously i squared is negative one. And then we'll have m choose 2k, and then we'll have cosine raised to the m minus 2k theta, and then sine raised to the 2k theta. Okay, so there we have the even part of the expansion. And now let's write the odd part of the expansion. So that'll be plus the sum as k goes from zero again to the floor of m over two, but now we're re-indexing k to two k plus one, but i to the two k plus one will be negative one to the k times i, because we can factor that out. So we might as well put the i out front, and then we'll have another minus one to the k, and now we'll have m choose two k plus one, that binomial coefficient, We'll have cosine to the m minus 2k minus 1 theta, and then sine to the 2k plus 1 theta. But now we can simply extract the real part of both sides. That'll be this cosine of m theta, and then this, you know, fairly lengthy sum. And the imaginary part of both sides of the equation, that'll be the sine of m theta, and then this lengthy sum, and we get nice formulas for cosine of m theta and sine of m theta, where m is a non-negative integer. Okay, so let's maybe get those over here on the board, and then we'll look at the fibonacci luca version of this. We just developed this nice formula for cosine m theta and sine m theta. Now we're gonna do something similar for Fibonacci numbers and Luca numbers. So Let's start with this Binet formula here and let's see what we can do with it. So let's maybe look at Lm times n over two plus the square root of five and then Fm times n over two. So here M is like our maybe expansion of the index, um, just like we have the M here and then n is playing the role of theta, where we had the thetas in the cosine sine version. Okay, so anyway, we can apply this formula right here, and that'll give us phi to the mn. But now, pretty clearly, that's equal to phi to the n raised to the m power. And now we can start unraveling this. So this will be, let's see, l sub n over 2 plus square root of 5 times f sub n over two, all raised to the m power. But now I can simply do a binomial expansion again. So let's do that. So that'll give me the sum as k goes from zero up to m. I have m choose k. And then let's see, I'll have the square root of five raised to the k. And then I'll have L sub n over two raised to the M minus K. And then F sub n over two raised to the, let's see, K. Okay, so that's looking good. But now the square root of five has this nice property that when you square it, you get the number five. But that means when you raise it to any even power, you get an integer. And when you raise it to an odd power, you get an integral multiple of the square root of five. So that motivates us to split this into even and odd parts just as we did before. But perhaps before we do that, I'd like to observe that I can take this two here and this two here in both of the denominators, and I can simply combine them together into two to the m, 
and bring them outside. That's because m minus k plus k is m. Okay, great. Now let's split this into even and odd parts. So we have one over two to the m, and then we'll have the sum as k goes from zero again to the floor of m over two. And now we'll have, let's see, five to the k, and then m choose two k. This is the shift or the re-index of k being sent to 2k. And then let's see, after that we'll have L sub n to the m minus 2k, and then we'll have F sub n raised to the 2k. So that's our even part. So now let's write down our odd part. So we'll have one over two to the m, and then I might as well take my square root of five out because I know that I'm gonna have one of those because I have square root of five to the 2k plus one here. And then I'll have my sum as k goes from zero up to, again, the floor of m over two. I have my five to the k, m choose 2k plus one now, l sub n to the m minus 2k minus one, and then f sub n to the 2k plus one. And now it's not like extracting real and imaginary parts, it's extracting, you know, rational numbers. In fact, here they're integers, and then integers times the square root of five. And that is simply because the square root of five is irrational, so there's no way that these could intertwine. So just looking at that, what will we have? Well, we'll have this object right here, this LMN over two, being equal to this big object right here. And then we'll have our FMN over two being equal to this over here, where of course we delete the square root of five on both sides. Okay, so let's get those written over here and then we'll have a nice conclusion. Okay, so there we have it down here, our Fibonacci and Luca version of these formulas. And observe throughout all of this, we see the role of cosine being played by the Luca numbers and the role of sine being played by the Fibonacci numbers. And in fact, you can take almost any trig identity and translate it into a Fibonacci Luca identity using this sort of idea. And that's a good place to stop.